Hello students and welcome to today's lesson, Banaras by Aldous Huxley. This is the first part of the lesson and it is being presented by Dr. P. V. Keita Lakshmi Patnaik of PGR Government Degree College, Narayan Guna, Hyderabad. Before we begin the lesson, uh, let us ask ourselves a couple of questions. Uh, so let me ask you students, uh, what do you know about Banaras? Uh, Anybody? Yes. Uh, Banaras is supposed to be uh, the spiritual capital of India. It is a town in, situated in Uttar Pradesh and it is supposed to have uh, been built somewhere around the 11th century BC. So do you know the other names with which this town is called? Yes, it is Baranasi and Kashi. So this town is famous for drawing Hindu pilgrims from all over the country and these pilgrims bathe in the river Ganga which is considered to be very sacred to Hindus and they perform especially funeral rites. Um, so there are something like 2000 temples along the pathways in this town and um, this includes the most famous temple which is the Kashi Vishwanath temple which is also known as the golden temple. So in this temple, um, we have the, the very famous lingam of the Hindu god Shiva. So this may lead us to the question as to what is this Englishman Aldous Huxley doing, uh, writing an essay on this uh, holy or spiritual town of the Hindus. So let us see uh, what it is that he's trying to tell us. But before that, let us take a quick look at the biography of uh, Aldous Huxley. Aldous Huxley was an English writer, novelist, and philosopher. In addition, he also wrote poetry, drama, film screenplays, and works of criticism. He was the grandson of the prominent biologist T.H. Huxley and the son of the biographer and man of letters Leonard Huxley. This famous family also included Aldous Huxley's brothers, uh, the physiologist Andrew Fielding Huxley and the biologist Julian Huxley. Considered as one of the greatest minds of his time, Aldous Huxley was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature seven times. His best known works are the novels Brave New World, uh, Point Counterpoint, Eyeless in Gaza, and Ape and Essence. His nonfiction work, The Doors of Perception, is also very well known. The present essay, Benares, was written in 1926 when Huxley had visited the Holy City and uh, he had done this on a day when Hindus had come to the Ghats to observe the solar eclipse. And um, he uses this occasion to reflect on mankind's irrationality. Since Huxley himself was a rationalist, uh, he is of the opinion that it is mankind's capacity for thought that has led to the belief in superstitions. So in this essay, he urges all Indians to come together and save the nation instead of wasting their energies on ritualistic gestures. So uh, let us read the essay now, students, and um, let us see what it is that Huxley has to tell us. Banaras by Aldous Huxley, uh, part one. So I shall be reading out the essay now. Please listen carefully, students. It was said that the eclipse of the sun will be visible from Banaras, but it needed more than smoke glass to see it. The eye of faith was also indispensable. That, alas, we did not possess. Partial to the point of being non-existent, the eclipse remained, for us at least, unseen. For it was not to look at the moon's silhouette that we had rowed out that morning on the Ganges. It was to look at the Hindus looking at it. The spectacle was vastly more extraordinary. So before we uh, I mean look at the explanation or before we try to discuss what is being said here, let us take a look at the, uh, the, the difficult words in this passage. Uh, the first one is uh, eclipse. This is eclipse of the sun. So the solar eclipse is an eclipse of the sun which happens when the new moon moves between the sun and earth blocking out the sun's rays and casting a shadow on parts of earth. Uh, Smoked glass. Uh, this is a reference to the glass that has been treated such that it can be used as a filter to look at bright objects without damaging one's eyesight. 
eye of faith uh, means from the point of view of faith indispensable is essential silhouette is a picture in solid black showing only the outline so let us now move back to the uh, to the passage it was said this is how the essay begins students it was said that the eclipse of the sun will be visible from banaras so uh, this is what uh, people have been saying or this is what uh, the holy books have said that uh, or maybe astrology has said that the eclipse of the sun would be visible from banaras and uh, huxley says that it needed more than smooth glass to see it so you people usually by then it was the practice to uh, see the sun uh, the i mean uh, uh, the bright sun through smoked glass which is like we have just seen specially treated glass uh, to see it but then mm, people use this glass to see the uh, sun but then uh, huxley says that the eye of faith was necessary it was essential because not many people would be able to see the eclipse it is only through the eye of faith that people could would be able to see it and that he says we did not possess that alas we did not possess he says so who uh, does we refer to uh, we refers to aldous huxley and a few other companions with whom he has come to visit the city and they are in a boat in the uh, river and they are actually watching this uh, spectacle they are not there to look at the uh, eclipse of the sun they are here actually to look at the hindus looking at the eclipse so uh, he goes on to say that uh, this eclipse is actually almost non existent and the reason for this is uh, mentioned later on in the essay but then he says that partial to the point of being non existent the eclipse remained for us at least unseen so this is a very important point students the eclipse is actually not to be seen here it, it will not be it would not be visible from uh, banaras actually uh so this was happening somewhere else but then since it is a ritual that uh, all the people were following were observing um it it is uh, almost unnecessary for all the people here uh, that you know whether or not the eclipse can be seen from here so uh huxley says for it was not to look at the moon silhouette that we had rowed out that morning on the ganges so he is very clear he says that uh, he was there on the ganges on that particular morning he was there on the river ganga only to see or to look at the hindus looking at the eclipse and look at the comment here students the spectacle was vastly more extraordinary the spectacle of the hindus looking at the eclipse or uh, uh, you know performing all the rituals was more extraordinary than the actual physical phenomena a uh, phenomenon of the uh, solar eclipse this is what huxley is saying so right at the beginning of the essay we can see that uh, huxley is pointing out to the central event in the uh, in the essay and which is the solar eclipse and he's talking about how he and his companions are there in the river uh, in a boat since he mentions rowing out so they are in a boat and they are watching the uh, hindus performing the rituals due to the uh, physical phenomenon which was uh, occurring then that was the solar eclipse so um we have taken a look at the difficult words and uh, so what is actually happening in this passage students the central event which is the solar eclipse is introduced the fact that the eclipse is all but invisible at banaras is mentioned so we have already looked at this uh, huxley makes it a point to mention that the eclipse is not visible at banaras it is actually visible at some other place um, uh, in some other corner of the earth but then uh, this doesn't matter to the hindus or to the people who are assembled there the purpose for which the author is there is stated and what is the purpose to look at the hindus looking at the eclipse the reason for this is revealed and the reason is that the spectacle would be extraordinary so uh, this is what uh, happens in the first passage students so let us move to the next passage there were at the lowest estimate a million of them on the bathing ghats that morning a million all the previous night and day they had been streaming into the town we had met them on every road trudging with bare feet through the dust an endless and silent procession in bundles balanced on their heads they carried provisions and cooking utensils and dried dung for fuel with the new clothes which it is incumbent on pious hindus to put on after their bath 
in honor of the eclipse sun. Many had come far. The old men leaned wearily on their bamboo staves. Their children astride on their hips, the burdens on their heads automatically balanced, the women walked in a trance of fatigue. Here and there, we would see a little troop that had sat down to rest casually, as is the way of Indians in the dust of the road and almost under the wheels of the passing vehicles. So now let us take a quick look at the difficult words. Uh, estimate is an approximate calculation. Ghat is a stairway leading down to a landing on the water. Trudge is to walk slowly and with heavy steps due to exhaustion. Provisions are a stock or supply of food. Uh, provisions is a word which refers to a stock or supply of food. Incumbent means necessary for someone as a duty or responsibility. Stave is a strong rod or stick. Astride means with a leg on each side off. Trance is a half unconscious state in which the person does not respond to external sensations. Fatigue is extreme tiredness resulting from mental or physical exertion or illness. So these are some of the difficult words uh, that we, we shall be coming across in this uh, paragraph. So let us quickly go back to the passage. Uh, so he has already, the Aldous Huxley has already described the scene on the um, ghats of the river Ganga. Uh, now he goes back to what has happened that morning. And he says that at the lowest estimate, uh, at the lowest calculation, a million of them were there on the bathing ghats that morning, he says, a million. And all the previous night and day, they had been streaming into the town. So the previous day, the previous night and day, all these people, this million uh, people had been walking and uh, moving into the town. And uh, the writer, Aldous Huxley and his, and his companions had actually met them on every road. They had seen these people trudging or uh, dragging their feet in a very tired manner and in a, with bare feet through the dust. And uh, this procession was an endless and silent procession, he says, because the people are so tired that they cannot speak, that they have no energy to speak. And so uh, there's a detailed description of these people, how uh, they carried bundles on their heads. Uh, and these bundles uh, had provisions and cooking utensils, and uh, they had dried dung for fuel, which is a very common thing in uh, India. And uh, they also had uh, new clothes mixed up with that. Uh, with the rest of these items. And these new clothes were uh, there for a specific reason. So uh, Aldous Huxley mentions how it is essential or it is a part of the ritual or a custom for pious Hindus or Hindus who are very religious to put on new clothes after their bath in honor of the eclipse sun. So uh, all these things were carried in bundles on their heads. So uh, Huxley says that many had come far. All these people have been walking from a very, uh, walking very long distances to reach Banaras in time for the solar eclipse. And uh, he also describes how the old men leaned very, in a very tired manner on their bamboo staves, uh, which are rods or sticks. And uh, the children, uh, and then the women are described. And these women have their children uh, on their hips. They carry their children on their hips and the burdens on their heads are automatically balanced. In fact, there is uh, a, a, you know, a, a tinge of uh, admiration at which, uh, I mean, in Aldous Huxley, when he describes uh, the way these people, uh, the men and the women, are actually undergoing so many hardships in order to reach this town. And uh, these women are uh, described as walking in a trance of fatigue. They're so tired, they're so filled with fatigue that it's almost as though they are in a trance they do not show any kind of response to the external uh, happenings around them. So here and there, these people would just sit down uh, very casually, he says, as, and he, there's a reference to the way Indians uh, actually do um, I mean, practice uh, such things, you know, where they just sit on the road anytime, anywhere, as and when they please. So remember students, this is a scene from 1926 and uh, India was mostly uh, a rural country then. And so these are villagers who are coming from various parts of the uh, state or maybe country, and they're all moving into Banaras in order to witness the solar eclipse. And so there is this description of uh, the million or countless number of people who are walking into the uh, town. So if we look at the, uh, the, look at the passage, we can see how um, the writer 
does some very specific things and what are they? Uh, the sheer number of the people streaming in, 1 million is mentioned. So this number 1 million is mentioned many times throughout the essay. So when we look at the fact that this is a huge number and that too, this was in 1926, it is really mind boggling. Uh, the next point is that the blind faith of the Hindus is emphasized as they travel long distances and bear many hardships to reach Benares. So in this uh, paragraph, we can see how when um, Aldous Huxley uh, kind of emphasizes this faith of the Hindus, because it is only due to this faith that all these people uh, manage to travel long distances in spite of all the different hardships that they have to bear. So uh, we have to remember this point, students. And then the superstitions with regard to the solar eclipse are also mentioned. And what are the superstitions? Uh, that you know they have to wear new clothes after the uh, eclipse is over. And, uh, they, and for this reason, they also bring their food and utensils and uh, fuel, and they carry all these things on their heads. So Indians, uh, almost a million or more than a million, have assembled here in Banaras to watch the solar eclipse. Moving on, uh, in the next paragraph, but, uh, Aldous Huxley says, and now the day and the hour had come. The serpent was about to swallow the sun. It was about to swallow him in Sumatra at any rate. At Benares, it would do no more than nibble imperceptibly at the edge of the disk. The serpent, one should say, was going to try to swallow the sun. A million of men and women had come together at Benares to assist the light of heaven against his enemy. The ghats go down in for long wide flights of steps to the river which lies like a long arena at the foot of enormous tiers of seats. The tiers were thronged today. Floating on the Ganges, we looked up at acres upon acres of humanity. So uh, we have here the demon uh, Rahu, who is uh, swallowing the sun. This is a reference to the Hindu myth or the Hindu story uh, belief that the solar eclipse occurs when Rahu, the uh, demon uh, who takes the form of a serpent and who swallows the sun, uh, and this results in the solar eclipse. Right. So let us take a look at the uh, difficult words. Serpent is, of course, a snake student, and Sumatra is a mountainous island in western Indonesia. So uh, in this uh, essay, uh, Aldous Huxley says that the eclipse is act actually visible only at Sumatra, and it is not visible at uh, Banaras. Nibble means take small bites out, out of. Imperceptibly means in so slight or gradual a manner that it cannot be seen. It is not visible to the, uh, or it is not immediately visible to the naked eye. And furlong is a unit of length which is equal to 660 feet. Arena is a level area surrounded by seating in which sports, entertainment, and other public events are held. Tier is uh, each in a series of rows or levels of a structure placed one above the other. And thronged means filled with a great number of people crowded together. So um, let us see this. Uh, what does um, Huxley say? And now the day and the hour had come. So after describing the people who were uh, walking or trudging along the, the roads um, on the way to Benares, uh, now he says the day and the hour has come. So it is that it is time for the solar eclipse. The serpent was about to swallow the sun. And then uh, within brackets, we can see how he uses parenthesis to say that it was about to swallow him in Sumatra at any rate. This is for the benefit of the reader. Uh, Huxley says that uh, the serpent, um, in a very um, ironical way, he says, the serpent was about to swallow him, the sun, in Sumatra. At Banaras, it would not do anything more than just take small bites out of it at the edge, you know, the sun's edge, very small bites, because uh, he's uh, emphasizing the fact that the solar eclipse would be almost invisible at Benares. So the serpent, one should say, was going to try to swallow the sun. So uh, look at the way he uses sarcasm to um, highlight what is a specific superstition of these people. A million of men and women had come together at Benares to assist the light of heaven against his enemy. So the light of heaven is, of course, the sun, 
and uh, Huxley says that all these men and women had come to Benares only to help the light of heaven uh, in his fight against his enemy and the enemy is of course Rahu the serpent. And uh, even this is a uh, very ironical students as it's very obvious we can make out how uh, Huxley is actually using irony and uh, sarcasm to show how uh, the belief of these people is actually very irrational. And then he moves on to a description of the ghats. So remember that uh, the, the author and his uh, friends are all in a boat on the river, uh, Ganges, and so they're all uh, turning towards, like, you know, they're all turned towards the ghats and they're watching the people on the ghats. And to them, uh, the ghats look, um, you know, they, it, 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 they appear in a very, um, a very strange or very different manner. And uh, how do they appear to the writer? Let us see. The ghats go down in for long wide flights of steps to the river. So for long as we have seen is a unit of length equal to 660 feet. So uh, there are these are very wide flights of steps and they go down to the river and uh, it looks as though the river is like a long arena at the foot of enormous tiers of seeds. So uh, the whole scene is described as though it is an area which is meant for entertainment or some other public events. And the tears were thronged today. They are filled with uh, uh, so many people on that day and floating on the Ganges. So this is now uh, a reference to the, the author and to his companions. He says, floating on the Ganges, we looked up at acres upon acres of humanity. So the emphasis is on the sheer number of people who have assembled there to watch the solar eclipse. Uh, so uh, if we analyze this passage, we can see how the Hindu story of Rahu the serpent devouring the sun is specifically mentioned. Of course, he doesn't mention the name Rahu, but then he speaks about the serpent. And the two important facts are repeated. And what are these facts? That the eclipse is imperceptible in Benares, that it is almost invisible in Benares, and that one million people have come to Benares to witness this event. So uh, the fact that these two uh, things are mentioned over and over again is only meant to emphasize uh, you know the uh, foolishness or the superstitious beliefs of these people who have come in a huge number to Benares to witness an event which is almost invisible. So it is only the ritual which is important. It is not the fact which is important here for these people. Uh, and then uh, Huxley also describes the ghats in uh, great detail. Uh, and this is meant to show how uh, such a huge number of people have come to this place only to witness this particular incident. And then the uh, next passage is actually very important because uh, he speaks about a very specific incident which happens there. As the writer and his uh, friends move on the uh, river in the boat, they move to a particular uh, place where uh, there, is, uh, there, is a less, there is less crowd. So uh, what happens there, let us see. On the smaller and comparatively unsacred ghats, the crowd was a little less densely packed than on the holiest steps. It was at one of these less crowded ghats that we witnessed the embarkation on the sacred river of a princess. Canopied and curtained with glittering cloth of gold, a palanquin came staggering down through the crowds on the shoulders of six red liveried attendants. A great barge, like a Noah's ship, its windows hung with scarlet curtains, floated at the water's edge. The major domo shouted and, and shoved and hit out with his rod of office. A way was somehow cleared. Slowly and with frightful lurchings, the palanquin descended. It was set down, and in the twinkling of an eye, a little passageway of canvas had been erected between the litter and the door of the barge. Uh, so, this is a palanquin. So, let us see. Uh, what are the important words or difficult words in this passage. Embarkation is uh, the act of passengers or crew getting aboard a uh, ship or aircraft. And canopied is, uh, it means covered with cloth roof. Palanquin is a closed means of transportation carried on the shoulders of four bearers. In this particular essay, it is carried by six uh, bearers. Liveried means wearing a livery or uniform for male servants. Barge is a large flat bottomed boat for carrying goods of people on rivers, lakes, etc. Noah's Ark refers to the biblical story of Noah 
uh, if you are aware of its students, and I'm not sure if you are aware or not. But then uh, Noah, uh, Noah's Ark is a story. I mean, this refers to the biblical story in which uh, the whole uh, earth was, uh, uh, you know, uh, deluged. And uh, there was a huge flood and uh, the whole earth was submerged. And Noah and his wife were able to uh, take their family and many animals on the uh, ship that he had built specifically for this occasion. And they were saved from this flood. And then uh, the next word is uh, Major Domo, which is uh, who is a head steward in a great household. Lurching means to move abruptly and unsteadily. And litter is a conveyance consisting of a chair or bed carried on two poles by bearers. Here, litter is actually the palanquin. It's just another word which is used for palanquin. So what happens here, students? As I mentioned earlier, um, Aldous Huxley and his friends were actually moving down the river, up and down the river. And so uh, after watching the holy ghats, they move on to smaller and comparatively unsacred ghats. And here the crowd is a little des less densely packed, like there are fewer people here. And it is at this particular, at a particular uh, less crowded ghat that they uh, get the opportunity to witness a very specific event. And what is that? It is the embarkation on the sacred river of a princess. So there is a princess who, uh, a princess arrives there in a palanquin. And uh, there is this very detailed uh, description of the palanquin. It is canopied, it is covered with a cloth roof. And it has curtains which, is, which are made from uh, uh, glittering cloth of gold. And uh, there are six uh, men attendants uh, who are wearing red uniforms. And these six attendants uh, carry this palanquin with great difficulty. They move down the crowd and reach the edge of the river. So embarkation means the act of boarding a uh, ship or an aircraft. And here it means uh, boarding a barge actually. Um, and the princess and her uh, uh, companions board the barge on the river, uh, the sacred river, which is the Ganga. And then there is this great barge. There's a barge waiting uh, at the water's edge. And uh, the writer Aldous Huxley compares it to Noah's Ark. And the windows have scarlet curtains. And uh, the barge is waiting to take this uh, princess and her companions down the ro uh, river in order to uh, witness this particular uh, event. Uh, and then there is this major domo or a head steward who shouts and tries to clear a way for uh, the palanquin to reach the barge. And there's a description where um, the, the palanquin is carried with great difficulty and it is uh, set, on, set down at the edge of the water. And uh, within no seconds, you know, within, uh, within no time at all, uh, the, there's a ca canvas passageway which is erected and uh, the woman, that is a princess, and her uh, women uh, companions uh, enter the uh, barge. So uh, let us see uh, what, what is actually happening in this particular passage. Uh, the scene, as we have seen, moves to a smaller, less crowded ghat, and the arrival of a princess in a covered palanquin is described in great detail. And the emphasis is on the fact that people, rich and poor, are all bound by the rituals and conventions of religion. So as we have seen, there are poor people on the ghats, the common people on the ghats, and then the arrival of the princess is described in great detail to emphasize the fact that all people, uh, no matter whether they are rich or poor, are bound by the rituals and conventions of religion. So this is uh, the intention of the writer, and uh, let us see what happens next. So as we have just seen, the princess uh, and her uh, other friends, as we can uh, make out in this particular passage, the princess is not alone. So uh, they descend from the palanquin and they uh, get into the barge. So how is th this particular event described? There was a heaving of the cloth of gold, a flapping of the canvas. The lady, uh, the ladies, he corrects himself, for there were several of them in the litter, had entered the barge unobserved of any vulgar eye, which did not prevent them a few minutes later when the barge had pushed out into the midstream from lifting the scarlet curtain and peering out with naked faces and unabashed curiosity at the passing boats and our inquisitive camera. Poor princesses, they could not bathe with their plebeian and unimprisoned sisters in the open Ganges. Their dip was to be in the barge's bilge water. The sacred stream is filthy enough under the sky. 
What must it be like after stagnating in darkness at the bottom of an ancient barge? So uh, moving on to the uh, difficult words, uh, I have actually provided a glossary after each passage because I thought it would be easier for you to look at the words and then uh, uh, you know, read the passage. This would make it easier for us to comprehend the passage. So heaving, sorry, is the act of lifting something with heavy effort, with great effort. Vulgar is associated with common ordinary people. Scarlet is a brilliant red color. Unabashed is not embarrassed. Inquisitive is curious. Libyan means commoners or ordinary people. Bilge water is the water that collects in the almost flat part of a ship's bottom. Stagnating means ceasing to flow or move. So uh, we, we can see how the passage begins with a description of um, the way the uh, palanquin is uh, you know, moved towards the barge and how the people around the princess and her uh, female uh, companions are very particular about ensuring that the princess and her friends are not visible uh, to the common, uh, common eyes. And so uh, there was a heaving of the cloth of gold, a flapping of the canvas. The lady or the ladies uh, had entered the barge unobserved of any vulgar eye. So Aldous Huxley makes it a point to emphasize how there is this uh, gap between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, and how the aristocratic princess is not to be seen by the common people. And so the people, uh, the, uh, the attendants of the princess are very particular that she is not seen uh, by the common people. So anyway, uh, the women, the, uh, the princess and her uh, women friends enter the barge, but then after they enter it, within a few minutes, they lift the scarlet curtain and peer out, look out uh, with naked faces and unabashed curiosity. They are not embarrassed. So they want to see uh, what is happening outside. And so they look at the passing boats and our inquisitive camera, he says, because as he mentioned earlier, he and his friends were also already on the sacred river, on the river Ganges in a boat, and they had cameras with them. So they were trying to uh, film it or photograph all the scenes on the um, uh, ghats. And so these women were actually very curious and they wanted to see what was happening outside. And um, Aldous Huxley says, poor princesses, is so filled with pity for these poor women. In fact, it is ironical that he uses the word poor. This is not a, a reference to their financial status. Poor refers to the, um, the status or the situation in which these women are because they are actually, it's almost as though they are imprisoned. It's almost as though they are in a prison which their social status has created for them. And so uh, Aldous Huxley says, these poor princesses could not bathe with their plebeian and unimprisoned sisters in the open Ganges. So he makes a comparison uh, between the uh, poor people and the rich people. And he provides this contrast where he says that uh, the princess is almost a prisoner because of her social status, uh, while the other women uh, who are actually bathing in the open waters are uh, free women. And then uh, the reason he says this is, uh, because he believes that uh, it is better to be in the open, even though the water, which is quite filthy enough under the sky, he, share, he says, the sacred stream is filthy enough under the sky, he says. So the, the water, the open waters of the Ganga are filthy enough uh, uh, given their, uh, uh, you know, the practice of uh, the people throwing dead bodies into the river and uh, using the river for all purposes. And so he says, he uses the word, uh, the expression poor princesses because he feels that these women were actually uh, very unfortunate because they could not take a bath in the, they could not bathe in the sacred river, in the open river. Instead, they had to bathe in the uh, water, which is at the bottom of the barge. And uh, the, he ends this pa passage with a question, what must it be like after stagnating in darkness at the bottom of an ancient barge? So this question is very important because it is actually pointing out to the, um, superstitious uh, beliefs of these people who think that water which is, uh, you know, stagnant water at the uh, bottom of this barge is sacred. So this is the question which uh, Aldous Huxley asks us and uh, it is supposed to attack, uh, it is actually a direct attack on the superstitious uh, beliefs of uh, these people. So 
um, if we analyze the passage, we can see that there are different state, uh, stages. Uh, the first is that the care taken to keep the princess and her companions out of the sight of the common people is described. Uh, also, the differences in the social status between the royal women and the common people is portrayed. Uh, and finally, the sheer foolishness in bathing in the stagnant, uh, stagnant water and the barge is emphasized. So these are the important points from this passage, students. So let us move on to the next uh, paragraph. Uh, Aldous Huxley and his friends uh, move on. And now, if, if you remember, uh, the first uh, scene was at the bathing uh, guards, the holy guards, and then they moved to the next scene, which is, or uh, the next uh, place, which is the less densely packed or less holy parts where they see the princess and her companions who are coming in a palanquin and uh, moving into the barge, which is on the river. And now we move on to the next scene, which is, um, you know, situated in the burning guards. Uh, so let us read the passage. We rode on towards the burning carts. Stretched out on their neat little oblong pyres, two or three corpses were smouldering. They lay on burning faggots. They were covered by them. Gruesomely and grotesquely, their feet projected like the feet of those who sleep uneasily on a bed too short under exiguous blankets. A little further on, we saw a row of holy men sitting like cormorants on a narrow ledge of masonry just above the water. Cross-legged, their hands dropped limply, palm upwards on the ground beside them. They contemplated the brown and sweating tips of their noses. The noise of an assembled million filled the air, but no sound could break the meditative sleep of the nose gazers. So this is a scene of the burning hearts. So these are dead bodies students and they're being burned here. So if you, uh, you must be aware that um, Varanasi or Benares has uh, guards which are uh, very specifically, uh, you know, meant for certain uh, rituals. Uh, the bathing guards are meant only for bathing and the burning guards are meant for, uh, you know, uh, doing the performing the funeral rites. So the dead bodies are brought to these guards and they are burnt here. So there, these uh, two types of guards are separate in uh, um, Varanasi or Banaras. So let us take a look at the difficult words. Oblong is a flat figure with unequal adjacent sides and uh, pyres means wood heaped for burning a dead body as a funeral rite. Smoldering means to burn slowly and without the flame. Faggots is a bundle of sticks bound together as fuel. Gruesome means abnormal and ugly. Grotesque means inspiring horror. Exigus means insufficient or scanty. Cormorants are large, long-necked seabirds. Ledge is a narrow horizontal shelf fixed to a wall. Masonry is structure built of stone or brick. So uh, as we have seen students, the, the author and his friends rode on towards the burning ghats. So this is the third type of ghats or the third place that they actually move on to. So here he, there's a very long description of uh, the dead bodies which are being burned. And uh, this description uh, is uh, meant to um, you know, uh, arouse feelings of disgust. And uh, uh, it's not a very pretty kind of a description. So the dead bodies are described, the corpses are described as stretched out on their neat little oblong pyres. Two or three corpses were smoldering. Smoldering is where uh, most of the burning is already over and uh, the flames are now down. And without the flames, the bodies are just, you know, burning slowly. So this is uh, not exactly a very, uh, you know, a beautiful description. It is actually very, very um, difficult to take. They lay on burning faggots. So what are faggots? Faggots are bundle of sticks. Uh, they are bundles of sticks which are bound together as fuel. So uh, the dead bodies lay on burning faggots and these faggots are also covered. They cover the dead bodies. So uh, the bodies are described as being gruesome and grotesque and their feet project out, out of the uh, pyres. And it looks as though these uh, bodies are the bodies of people who sleep under, on a bed uh, under two short uh, blankets, you know, blankets which are you know, uh, insufficient to cover the whole body. And this whole description actually uh, uh, creates a feeling of disgust. And uh, remember students, this is uh, written by an Englishman during, uh, I mean, the year 1926. And uh, basically, this is 
uh, meant for Western readers. So I'm sure that the Western readers would have been filled with disgust while reading this particular passage. A little further on, he says, we saw a row of holy men sitting like cormorants on a narrow ledge of masonry just above the water. So cormorants are large, long-necked seabirds. So there's this description of the holy men uh, who are all thin and so thin that their necks look very long. And they sit on a narrow ledge of masonry and they're all sitting cross-legged and their hands are dropped limply, palms up, upwards, and they are actually meditating. This whole uh, description is the description of uh, uh, people or men who are uh, meditating. And um, he finds it very strange that these uh, sadhus or holy men are actually so deep in their meditation that um, they are not at all disturbed by the noise of an assembled million. So this noise must have been uh, tremendous, but then it does not succeed in uh, breaking their medita meditation. Uh, the nose gazers, as he uh, says sarcastically or ironically, uh, are, uh, you know, it is a reference to the meditative pose which is uh, taken on, uh, taken up by the uh, sadhus. And so he says, Aldous Huxley says that this noise, which must have been uh, very, very, very uh, tremendous, is actually almost inaudible for these uh, nose gazers or for the holy men who are meditating. So, um, Aldous Huxley finds it very strange and unusual. In fact, he tries to, uh, there is an attempt to understand how these people, uh, these holy men can actually uh, continue with their meditation. So um, what is this, what is uh, Aldous Huxley actually doing in this passage, students? Uh, the scene moves to the burning ghats where corpses are described in a grotesque manner. The scenes of the praying crowds and the burning dead bodies are juxtaposed to create a sense of distaste, distaste and disgust. So we have these people here uh, on uh, neighboring ghat where they are all actually praying and uh, performing rituals and very close to it on this ghat, the burning ghats, we can see how uh, corpses are being burnt. So there is this just juxtaposition of the praying uh, people and the uh, burning uh, corpses. And there's also a description of the holy men um, who are described as being deep in meditation and who are shown to be uh, undisturbed by the noise made by all these people. So the idea is to show how these holy men have a kind of a mystical distance from uh, the other people there. So all this is described by Huxley within this paragraph. And uh, finally, let us see. Uh, for, uh, this is the final passage in today's lesson, students. At a given moment, the eye of faith might must have observed the nibblings of the demoniacal uh, serpent. For suddenly and simultaneously, all those on the lowest steps of the ghats threw themselves into the water and began to wash and gargle, to say their prayers and blow their noses, to spit and drink. A numerous band of police abbreviated their devotion and their bath in the interest of the crowds. The front of the waiting crew was a thousand yards wide, but a million people were waiting. The bathing must have gone on uninterruptedly the whole day. Time passed. The serpent went on nibbling imperceptibly at the sun. The Hindus counted their beads and prayed, made ritual gestures, ducked under the sacred slime, drank and were moved on by the police to make room for another installment of the patient million. We rode up and down taking snapshots. West is West. So let us take a look at the important or difficult words. Demoniacal is wild and evil. Simultaneously means at the same time. Abbreviated means shortened. Ritual is something which is done as a religious rite. Gesture means movement of the hands, face, or other parts of the body. Slime here refers to the muddy water of the Ganges. Installment is one part of a series. So uh, this is the very detailed description of the various gestures or actions that uh, all the people uh, perform uh, at the specific moment when uh, the eclipse occurs. So let us see what happens. At a given moment, because I'm sure all of you are aware that uh, uh, the eclipse is uh, actually, um, you know, 
uh, foretold in the, our books of astrology and the Hindus have a very specific system of um, predicting all these celestial events and so at the given moment the eye of faith must have observed the nibblings of the demoniacal serpent he says uh, here uh, we have to uh, mention that we have to consider the fact that um, our astrology is actually uh, very accurate so uh, Indians have been able to predict a solar eclipse, the exact time when uh, the eclipse takes place. And so even though uh, Aldous Huxley is uh, very ironical here, uh, we need to uh, remember that the exact time is definitely um, you know, predicted by uh, the Hindu sacred books. So at a given moment, the eye of faith must have observed the nibblings of the demoniacal serpent, he says because he says this because suddenly and simultaneously all the people there on the lower steps of the ghats uh, perform certain rituals and what are they first they threw themselves into the water uh, he is actually uh, using a kind of derisive humor to say this but then all the people suddenly uh, started uh, you know um, uh, dipping into the water and they started um, performing their rituals and what were the rituals the which rituals were like this they went on like this they began to wash and gargle to say their prayers and blow their noses to spit and drink so this whole description is a description of the various actions that these people were doing on the uh, in the water at the specific time and a numerous band of police abbreviated the devotion uh, he also refers to uh, the policemen who are there with the specific uh, purpose of uh, trying to move uh, the, these people along as there are other people waiting to perform the rituals. And so the front of the waiting crew was a thousand yards wide. So there's this description of the uh, thousand yards of uh, uh, ghat, which was, um, you know, which were all like covered by Indians or Hindus. And uh, all these people are busy with uh, all their rituals. Uh, but then a million people were waiting, he says. So the bathing must have gone on uninterruptedly the whole day. The whole day these people were there actually performing all these rituals. And time passed, he says. The serpent went on nibbling imperceptibly at the sun. So once again, there is this reference to the uh, imperceptible nibbling of the sun. So uh, Aldous Huxley does this deliberately. Like I said, he is actually trying to emphasize the fact that the uh, eclipse is actually invisible at this particular place. The Hindus counted their beads and prayed and made ritual gestures. So it is not enough to say all these things. Uh, Aldous Huxley also refers to how they duck under the sacred slime. So the, the, this very uh, usage is uh, interesting students. He says slime because he, he's very specific. This is the second time that he has referred to uh, the water as being uh, muddy or dirty. Earlier, he had uh, referred to it as the filthy water, and now he says sacred slime. So uh, the Hindus counted their beads and prayed, made ritual gestures, ducked under the sacred slime, uh, drank, and were moved on by the police to make room for another installment, he says, of the patient million. So uh, the um, description is repeated here in this paragraph. So the idea is to emphasize how uh, the Hindus we're actually making ritual gestures which have no meaning whatsoever. And then he talks about uh, the actions that were performed by the writer himself and his friends. We rode up and down taking snapshots. So from morning till uh, the afternoon he is busy. Uh, these people are busy taking snapshots as they moved up and down the river. And look at what he says at the end. West is west, he says. So uh, if east is east, if uh, the East is uh, filled with superstitious beliefs and rituals and customs, then the West is West because the West believes in, uh, the West is very fond of uh, treating the East as a barbaric uh, you know, continent and uh, they treat these Eastern countries, especially India, as being a barbaric nation. And uh, so let us see what we have in this particular passage. The sudden and simultaneous actions of the people at the designated time are described in great detail. Uh, in addition to this, uh, let us see what are these uh, actions. Bathing, washing, gargling, praying, blowing of noses, spitting and drinking, all are mentioned 
they're all mentioned to bring out the range of activities done throughout the day by the million people assembled here on the ghats of the river ganga the fact that the author and his companions spend the whole day taking photographs of the events is emphasized to show the fascination of the west for all the idiosyncrasies of the barbaric east so uh, all these passages uh, today what we have seen uh, students we have just read uh, a number of passages so all of them are actually meant to emphasize uh, two things the first is the superstitious beliefs of the hindus um, and uh, how they actually um, perform various rituals for an event which is actually not visible to the naked eye and uh, the other thing that is very important here students is the fact that uh, the west is uh, the west has a fascination for the barbaric east so the west is always trying to portray itself as being uh, uh, rational as um, you know giving importance to reason while the east in comparison is um, supposed to be irrational and uh, given to superstitions so this students is um, the first part of the lesson that we have just read i hope you have enjoyed it i hope you have understood all the events and descriptions that have been uh, given to us in this lesson uh, and to, uh, in the next class we shall be dealing with the second part of the lesson so that's all for today students um, goodbye and thank you